change lives, change lives, change, change, lives. change organizations, change organizations, change organizations, change the world. Vikram, it's uh, truly a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, you. I don't think I've told you this yet, but for a period of time in my life, I had my student loan, my home mortgage, my checking account, my savings account, and my credit card all with Citi. <laughs> so in my mind, you are too big to fail. <laughs> You've been paying on time? <laughs> <laughs> so we've um, had a chance to interact a couple times on That's Capitol right. Hill. That's right. Um, and when I was on Capitol Hill, oftentimes senators and even the White House would say, what does Vikram think? So I thought a good place to start would be to get your view of the state of play of, of the global financial markets. Share with us what is top of mind for you when you think of the global economy. Yeah. I think that's a good place to start, Derek. It's good to see all of you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I saw Derek first when he was in Senator McConnell's office, and this was during the depths of the crisis. And uh, it's nice to see you again in a different time uh, <laughs> as well. <laughs> so let me uh, say that uh, obviously things have come a very long way since the crisis. And, uh, and for all of you, by the way, these last couple of years have been a good couple of years to be in school as well. <laughs> um, but uh, there's still tremendous uncertainty ahead of us. Uh, we may have avoided the crisis, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. When I look around the world, we're living in a time of tremendous uncertainty. Uh, on an economic basis, Europe is a significant issue. They've bought some time. It remains an issue. It's not exactly clear what the path is and what the destination is for that matter, and that's, that is a significant uh, a pillar uh, that we need to get through. It's costing us about a percent, percent and a half in GDP here and around the world, so this is a significant issue to deal with. There's the U.S. debt issue. How are we going to deal with that? Not till after the elections. Uh, people ask about what's going to happen in China. This is a country that grew at 9, 10 percent a year uh, for a, a very long period of time. How is it going to grow? What growth rate? And can they manage that? There are uh, regulatory issues, obviously there are issues surrounding banks, but there are regulatory issues around the world, and on top of that, there are political issues. You know, this is a year uh, which, uh, in, in which there are going to be 32 significant elections around the world, mm -hmm. and 10 to 12 of them in really major countries, and these elections, uh, by the way, are uh, influenced by the fact that the world's really not at full employment today, not even close. Uh, if the world needed to get to full employment today, you'd need about 200 million jobs. And by the way, just to put that in context, over the next 10 years, if the world needed to, and the world does need to and could employ everybody who would be employable, the world would need another 400 million jobs. So you're looking at a political environment that is rightly influenced by the fact that the number one job around the world is create meaningful employment and work for people, uh, and we've got a lot of work to do on that. So when you put it all together, you're looking at a time of tremendous uncertainty. Not only that, uh, you know, you've, you live in a, in a time where you get real-time results Well, what you're doing. You know, the bond markets every morning wake up and uh, they uh, tell every country what they think about their debt. I mean, they, they tell every company, you know, how safe they are. The stock market does exactly the same thing, talks about growth, and I don't need particularly this group, tell you about Twitter and everything else, and you know, every morning we know exactly what people think about us. Uh, and uh, so the real-time feedback is a different mechanism. So whether we like it or not, we're living in a time of volatility. Mm -hmm. It's going to be with us for a while until we figure some of these things out. Um, and, uh, and we're all dealing with it, and we're learning to deal with it. And, and frankly, it's not that we're going to have any near-term answers to some of these uncertainties we've talked about. So that's the environment we've got to learn to live with. Let me just say one more thing. I was out um, at a major industrial company in, uh, in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, last Wednesday, great company. It's it's the soul of America. They uh, manufacture uh, tractors, excavators, etc. I won't say the name. You can figure it out. <laughs> um, and uh, this is a company that put uh, a lot of money to work, almost four billion dollars of investments. And I was talking to the management team and I say, you know, some days we wake up and feel really great. That's exactly what we ought to be doing. 
you know, may in, possibly we haven't invested enough. Let's keep going. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, one of the uh, senior managers said, but there are days when I wake up in a cold sweat. Did I do exactly the right thing? You know, what does this mean? Where's the world going to? But that's the kind of environment we still are in. And what that means, we may have stability, we may be going the, uh, the right direction, but there's a lot more work to do if we want to get back to our main goal, which ought to be to create the kind of jobs and the kind of opportunities for young people and people who need work. And it's going to take some time. So as you think about five, 10 years from now, you talked about how today there's just tremendous uncertainty, tremendous volatility. What will it take to get us to a place where there is that stability, where there will be jobs for, for all of us? Well, look, I mean, I think uh, uh, the dean and I were talking about some of these things earlier when, when he, um, he didn't know you were going to ask that question, by the way, but <laughs> he asked me that question uh, in a different way. Uh, but there are some short-term things we need to get through. I, we have to get through Europe. We really do. And it is 25% of the world economy. It's significant. The issue with Europe is it's not like they may grow slowly, but so much of the financial system around the world and so much of the world economy is integrally tied up with Europe mm -hmm. that if something goes wrong, Europe is too big to fail in many ways. And so, uh, so the problem uh, that you deal with is a problem where you cannot necessarily count on what this currency is going to look like. Mm -hmm. So if you're a bank and, and an Italian company wants you to make a 10-year loan, you know, usually you would say, let's figure out what you're going to use the money for. Let's go ahead and do it. Uh, but there is a moment of thought that goes through your mind that says, how do I know I'm going to get paid back in euro? And if it's not the euro, what is it going to be? You know, could be the lira. Uh, and, and once you start thinking about the fact that there is so much riding on a currency union without a fiscal union, you start thinking about, boy, I really need to be safe. I really need to pull back. I really need to be careful as to how I interact with Europe. And that kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So uh, whether we like it or not, that's front and center. And the markets are saying that it has to be addressed. There are economic solutions to what needs to be done. A lot of them require a lot of political strength, and it's tough given the fact there's an election in France, uh, you know, there's going to be an election in Germany next year, there are lots of other elections going on, and so we're going to have to watch this one. But on a longer term basis, I think there are two things that are really interesting uh, to me. The first, uh, you all may or may not know this, but, but I think we made a significant dent in energy and energy availability. And I know that all of us want to look at alternatives, and we do. By the way, we finance a lot of sustainable developments, alternative energy companies, uh, as they move forward in their journey towards creating different kind of energy, cleaner energy, safer energy. But the biggest development in the world is that in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. the world collectively has found about 2.4 trillion barrels equivalent of energy, new energy. That's huge. The world consumes about $33 billion, 33 billion barrels of oil every year. You're talking about 2.4 trillion new ones. There's a lot in America. As a matter of fact, if we get everything right, America can become a net exporter of energy over the next 10 years. There's about 200 billion barrels of that in China. Talk about supporting growth. So, you know, when you look out 10 years, if we can get through the European situation, put it in the right place for now, you're looking at an environment where you may have the kind of availability of energy and the kind of cost structure around that that could actually spur a new cycle of growth. That's very, very important to keep in mind. In addition to that, you add to that the emerging market growth. And if we can get some of the regulatory things in the finance area, et cetera, ironed out, there is a new cycle of infrastructure investment that needs to be made here in the US, and certainly a lot in Africa, and Asia, and Latin America. By the way, Brazil needs about a trillion and a half dollars of infrastructure investment over the next 10 years. 
That's a huge cycle. You get that right, that can create a lot of jobs as well as create the kind of growth the world needs. So I'd look to a newly found positive perspective on energy. I'd look to the world getting together, trying to figure out how to finance its infrastructure over the next 10 years. I'd look to emerging market growth and the consumer there growing very well. And I'd look to trade and global capital flows as the four big drivers. Ultimately, the solution out of this uncertainty has to be growth. There's no, way, no other way to create those jobs other than creating this growth. And so I think things are coming together. It's gonna to take a lot of political will. We're gonna to have to get through these 32 elections, find out what these uh, governments and philosophies are gonna be like, but there is a real possibility we could get this right. On, um coming together and solving these problems. It's interesting you use that phrase, especially during this time. It, it seems like, especially with the banks, there's a lot of criticism, right? The narrative is essentially banks caused the crisis and government bailed out the banks. So how do you respond to this narrative that's almost developed, becoming part of US history now? That how do you respond to this criticism? Look, I think uh, um, the first place to do is you've got to start by acknowledging that the financial system has lost trust and credibility with people out there. And there's, you know, it's, 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 it's as plain as night and day. And that, uh, and that a lot of that uh, was because the financial system, and it's not only banks. By the way, there's a huge shadow banking system. There, there are lots of different aspects of finance. Uh, but the banking system uh, uh, somehow uh, swerved to some extent, away from serving clients and serving the real economy, which is what the intent is towards serving itself. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, it has caused a lot of hardships for a lot of people, as we witness from what's happening here in the US, but also what, from witness what's happening in, in, uh, in Europe. And I think that's an important part of the narrative. And it starts with acknowledging that that's really what happened. You take a look at a company like ours. Well, what are we doing? Well, when I came in uh, to, the, uh, to this position and, and, and the deans made it really extremely clear, I do not get any award for market timing, uh, for sure. <laughs> but as I came in, um, you know, I had to start looking at everything. So are we in the right businesses? Why are we doing what we're doing and what should we be? And it became very clear that we needed to return to the basics of banking as a bank. And we decided to sell 40% of the companies and 40% of the assets that we held. And, and we're actually the only large bank that has shrunk in size as a result of that. We're three quarters of the way through that. We got another 10% to go. But our core decision as a bank was return to the basics of banking. Figure out what you're good at. We're in 160 countries. We finance global trade, global capital flows, serve IBM, serve Exxon, serve Google, serve Apple, serve everybody around the world because they have offices around the world. And not only that, there are imports and exports going on. Focus on what you're good at. Get back to the basics of what you're good at and get out of those things that are peripheral and not important to the business. That was a critical, critical decision. In addition to that, we set out some very clear criteria and principles for what we do and how we do it. And, the, and other than the obvious, which should be, we, we're here to serve the real economy, we're here to serve clients, I call it common purpose. We have the same purpose with our clients, we have the same purpose with each other. The most important pillar of that, to me, is practicing responsible finance. And I tell all my people, uh, in the company, before you engage with a client, before you do a transaction, ask yourself three questions. Ask yourself whether it's right for your client, ask yourself whether it adds any economic value, and ask yourself if it is right for the system or responsible to the system as a whole. And the answer on all three must be yes. And only then you should proceed. That's what banking's been about. And that's what we've been about for 200 years. I mean, we got founded in 1812 as a bank uh, in, when a bunch of merchants came together in New York. They needed to finance New York-Liverpool trade. There's no other place they could get that, uh, that kind of financing. And, and, and since then, uh, some of you might have seen some of the ads were running, but we've been literally connecting the world, financing some of the most transformative projects in the world, the Panama Canal, the Transatlantic Cable, you know, the, the, the jumbo jet, I mean, you know, the list goes on and on. That's what we're supposed to be doing. 
And if you get back to doing what you're supposed to be doing and you practice responsible finance, you get to restoring trust and credibility. It's not going to happen through ads. It's going to happen by doing the right thing. The world's going to look back and say, this is the financial system that truly serves us and is truly serving the real economy. What, one more comment that's important. I do know that we're big as a bank, and there are other banks that have gotten big. The most important thing in business, is, and you all are going to know this, you, you, you need to be sized appropriately for the task at hand. We're only as big as our clients need to be, and that was a big part of our redesign as a company. Now, unfortunately, part of that meant we had to go from 375,000 people to 260,000 people as a company. We're completely focused on those businesses that are really important to our clients. But that's the narrative, and I think that's the narrative that's really going to be important for the financial system to be on. You seem to have spent a lot of time thinking about finance, and, um, and I'd like to switch gears and talk about your background and your career in finance. You've been a professor, a finance professor, an investment banker, a trader, you started a hedge fund, and now you're CEO of a Wall Street firm. So I get the sense you like finance. Well, I, you know, it, it, it's a, I can't hold a job. What can I tell you? <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's a, uh, you know, that's not where I started. I mean, I, um, growing up, uh, you know, culture has a lot to do with it, and, and what you are expected to do is sometimes driven by, by what people think you ought to be. And so when I was growing up in India, you know, you either had to be a doctor or an engineer. So I said, okay, fine, I'll be an engineer. And I started there, and, and, um, and that was good. I mean, I enjoyed it. Never any good at it, um, I thought. <laughs> uh, so I said, well, you know, maybe I'll be a good banker. What do you know, <laughs> right? So, uh, uh, but I, I went from engineering and I went into business school. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed economics. Um, but, um, uh, and, and you're right. I mean, I really enjoy the subject of markets and how decisions get made, how it's real time, uh, public policy, economic policy. These are all exciting. Yet, you know, finding exactly what to do with that, um, you know, was not easy. I, uh, I um, you know, started off believing and thinking I would like being an, a, an academics, a researcher, a teacher. I like that, but I, write, I like real world problems more. And, uh, and uh, you know, it all came together when, when, when I wound up going to Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley back then was about 2,500 people. I mean, it was, it was the size of some of the smaller private equity funds today. <laughs> In some ways, it was a different era. It's almost 30 years ago. And that was really enjoyable because um, I had a lot of uh, ability to do things I wanted to do. And, uh, and, uh, and I grew up through that. And, and I've never really thought back as to how I got from here to here to here. There are lots of, uh, of um, uh, interesting incidents that happen along the way that, that, that guide you. But I do enjoy uh, the topic. And you got to do that. I mean, if you're not passionate about learning, if you're not passionate about what you're doing, you don't like the subject matter, you know, might as well go do something else. And that's, uh, that's a critical aspect of what makes one successful. You just mentioned that there were a lot of incidents that made you, you know, make different decisions. Could you share with us, as all of us in this room are trying to figure out what to do when we grow up, <coughs> how did you <coughs> go about making those decisions? What are some key inflection points? Yeah, first of all, don't try to grow up too soon and too fast. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't, uh, underestimate the, the benefit of youth and what you got and, uh, and the, the opportunities that, that gives you. You know, I really never tried to manage my career. I never thought about uh, uh, the future in that way. I mean, if you, if you, you, you couldn't write a novel collecting the, uh, connecting the dots of my career and say, here's something that could have been planned ever. So it never happened that way. To me, the most important thing I learned was from um, one of my teachers, one of my professors said, look, there are very simple rules. Just figure out what you're really passionate about and follow that. Just do that. Secondly, you know, if you happen to be passionate about something that's a growth industry, that's great, by the way. That's, that's what you should really try and see if you can get passionate about that. And, uh, <laughs> and lastly, uh, you know, if you are going to go out and do something, make sure you do it with a company or people that have the right values and that you really like working with it. And that's it. And, and, uh, and I thought I did that. I mean, that's how I picked the places I went and who I worked with and who I uh, worked for as well. Um, and never really managed my career along the way. You know, one thing led to the other, led to the other, led to the other. When I 
uh, left academia to go to Morgan Stanley, there was a point in time that uh, there were a number of people who were finance professors or economics professors who left academia to go into, uh, into business. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that I compare anywhere close to him, but Fisher Black left at that point MIT to go into business. Uh, Stephen Kielhofer, I mean, there are a whole host of people who had left academia. And, and so it seemed just right, because the real world problems were there in, in corporate finance, in capital markets. Uh, there were no real futures markets back then. The options markets were new. Derivatives was a, uh, was a concept in textbooks. I mean, these were all sort of interesting times, and that's, that's how I got there. And the industry grew. I grew with it. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think the most uh, important benefit to me was that I found myself at a place which was a real meritocracy. I mean, you're talking about uh, investment banking back in 1982, 83. Um, you know, uh, how shall I say? It was not exactly the bastion of diversity uh, <laughs> back then. Uh, and to find a, a, a somebody who, who was born in India, grew up, become an engineer, get a PhD of, of all the things, wind up at Morgan Stanley, and then wind up becoming president, it, it says a lot more about the company I was at than it says about me. Right? That that was the environment that allowed it to happen. And to me, uh, it really was about having an environment of true meritocracy where learning was rewarded, performance was rewarded, and that if you did better, you got ahead better. And that's really what happened. The, the most important decision I had to make in my career, the most important decision I had to make was to go from an, uh, being an individual producer, somebody who was really good at something and really enjoyed doing it, to somebody who decided that actually, you know what, I could enjoy becoming a manager. It's very different to be good at what you're doing. It's a completely different thing to say, now I'm going to get my enjoyment by watching others succeed. Now, that transition is a very, very difficult transition to make. And, uh, and you know, it, it, it's one of those things where you have to teach yourself that you go from being the valedictorian to somebody who manages valedictorians, and there are plenty of them here, I know, uh, and uh, how you manage that talent, how you nurture that talent, how you grow it, was a very big shift, and that's probably the single biggest shift that got me from what I was, a financial professional, or somebody who really enjoyed that, uh, to where I am today. I, um, that reminded me of something I'd read in your background. Um, I'd read an interview with your father in September of 08, and he said, the day you're appointed. He didn't know that was going to be public, by the way. My dad is, uh, now let me see, my dad is uh, 89 years old, and he's still, uh, well, forget about him. I don't understand Twitter, so, you know, you can. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. He, um, he said the day you were appointed CEO of Citi, the first thing you did when you got home was to call him in Mumbai to share the good news with him. And, um, and in that interview, he talked about how he was so proud of your humility, given all of these career, you know, just accomplishments you had made, had reached over the last 10 years, and, and that he was also proud of the confidence you were, as you stared down the abyss and the crisis. And so I, it made me very curious about your upbringing. When you think about sort of the 16 years in India and growing up in New York, sort of what, what in your background prepared you for the crisis? Well, you know, I, uh, uh, I, I didn't, uh, I'm not so sure I called him to share the good news. <laughs> 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 At least I called him to get a lot of support. I know that, and uh, he's always been supportive. Um, and uh, look, I mean, it's it's very hard to piece all of this together. Every bit of everything that I've done has been a learning experience uh, along the way. Uh, and you know, you, you sort of you learn a few things um, uh, once you become a manager, or you, you try to become a manager leader. It, it becomes very obvious. You know, you're not a leader unless you got followers, right? I mean, if people are not willing to follow you, it doesn't matter. Um, what else? Uh, what else you learn or think about? And so um, the uh, the simple the simple sort of truths that like, and somebody said that in your video that you showed earlier is true, and I think it was John Doerr, you know? It's, it's uh, trust and integrity are the number one things. Mm -hmm. And so if you have the values that go with always making sure you're trusted as somebody is honest and says the right things, does the right thing, that's a critical thing, and that's the number one 
uh, attribute of a good leader. The, the second attribute is a leader who understands uh, that the team, well, the team needs to feel the leader is looking after the team and thinking mm -hmm. about what's best for the team. Well, that's part of the community. That's how we grew up uh, in India. It's part of being part of the family. It's really important. Uh, you know, you need functional skills. Of course you do. You gotta be good at what you do. Uh, you need to be able to know how to make um, uh, decisions. And a lot of experience helps with that, by the way. The more experience you have, the better decision maker you are. It's as simple as that. You don't grow up, you don't, you're not necessarily born with that. You can learn it and you grow with it. I think that becomes uh, a very critical part uh, of, uh, of uh, what you do because that really drives judgment in, mm -hmm. in many ways. And judgment is sort of accumulation of all the skills you learned um, over the years. I think uh, uh, the, the, the ability to communicate is critical. I mean, you cannot underestimate the need people have to know what's going on and why you're doing what you're doing, why are you going in a particular direction, and as much as you think communication is important, think again. It's probably the most important thing you can do as a leader, and I think the last part um, is, uh, uh, and uh, you know, you talked about that, you talked about what my dad said, um, um, the, the, the line that always stuck with me was the line that John F. Kennedy used, which is that civility is not a sign of weakness. And so humility is a big part of what you learn. And believe me, when you trade, you learn humility. When you run a hedge fund, <laughs> you learn humility. And, and, and so to, to lead with humility is, is really what makes for uh, people rallying around uh, what you want to get done. So I can't tell you exactly what happened, where, where, where I learned some of these things, or some of these things that that were part of my upbringing. But uh, but ultimately, it's sort of the, the the culmination and the cumulative aspects of everything I've gotten done over the years that brought me here. Thank you for sharing with us your values. Um, that. Fast forward to sort of this point in time, one question that every GSB student in this room has had to answer is what matters most to you and why? It's a question in our application, and so we spend dozens of hours thinking about it and wrestling over it, and so I know you have about 15 seconds to think about it, but what <laughs> matters most, most to you and why? Well, uh, so, um, uh, God, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> we know, we all know. <laughs> Send me some of your answers, will you? Uh, <laughs> I'll keep them for uh, future reference. Uh, well, look, I, mean, I, I, I come at everything I do with a sense of responsibility. Uh, and I have a responsibility for, towards my two kids, making sure they get the right kind of education, the right kind of background. I, keep, I, I get the same sense for city, which I'm running. I, I feel a sense of responsibility for the 260,000 people that are with the uh, city. I feel a response, sense of responsibility for, uh, for the, uh, the clients of the company. I feel responsibility for, uh, for Columbia University. I'm on the board of trustees. Sorry about that, but it's, uh, <laughs> it is a responsibility I, I have. So what matters most to me is that uh, is that I not only take those responsibilities I have seriously, mm -hmm. and I do the best I can, but that the world looks at what I've done and say, you know what, he tried to do the best he can to fulfill those responsibilities to the best of his capabilities. That really matters to me. Mm -hmm. um, you just touched on your two kids, and I have one final question before we open up to the audience, but. Um, but as you think of the world your children will grow up in, they're a few years younger than I think most of us in this room. And as you think about the future world that they will lead, and as you sort of look at this room of future entrepreneurs and future business leaders and folks who will lead nonprofits, what um, are some of the two, three, four, five key life lessons you want to impart to the next generation of business leaders? Well, look, I think uh, to me the most important thing is you cannot succeed unless you are doing something you're passionate about. That is the key lesson to me. I mean, it's, it is absolutely critical. Your success, 
your, uh, your greatness comes from that. And so I tell my two kids, you got to find your passion. I mean, they're young. You know, one of them just started university. The other one's still in high school. And, uh, and they're searching. And it's OK. I mean, you got to keep searching. I mean, it took me a while to, to get to what I thought I liked. So that's the most important thing. Figure out what it is you really like. And I don't really mind what it is. I mean, frankly, it's not my thing. It's their thing. They got to figure out what they like and follow that. I think that's really important. The second thing I, I, I uh, would impart to them is make sure you appreciate, understand the importance of your social relationships mm -hmm. and the trust that is really implied in those and what it means to uh, to be part of those social relationships. And you know, some people think about this as citizenship. Yeah, you can talk about it that way, but it really is about, uh, about you live in a community, right? And you live with your friends, and what does that mean? How should you behave? I think that's, that's, that's to me, the second uh, most important thing. It's, it's really uh, important. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I think I stop right there in terms of those two things I think are absolutely critical. Uh, to me, I hope we've done everything we can, we can to impart them the best values. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, that if they're passionate enough and they have the right social relationship, the right uh, sort of human relationships they can carry on, they can be successful as they want to be. I think they're fortunate, lucky to be uh, second generation Americans. We're first generation Americans having come here. I mean, there is no other country that I know of uh, that can provide young people with the kind of entrepreneurship capabilities that this country can. Not one, not anywhere. For the 160 countries that I've been to, there is something so unique about what's happening in America and what America is all about that I'm absolutely sure that if they just uh, stick to passion, stick to uh, minding their relationships and, and, and human interactions, and the last part's really important, is nobody got anywhere without a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. And so if they do that, they're going to be fine. Thank you but. very much. Now we'd like to open up um, to questions from the audience. There's going to be a few folks walking around with mics, so please raise your hand, and um, somebody will come and find you. We have one up here. Hi, my name is Sahil. I'm a master's student in the management science department. So as a leader, how did you go about streamlining your company from 370,000 people, employees to 260 yeah. uh, without disturbing the employee motivation and company culture such that it does not affect Citigroup's future progress? Yeah, I think that's a great question. It's a very important question. So um, to me, uh, streamlining comes in a variety of different forms. And let me tell you how we did it. The first thing uh, is, as I said, we decided what business are we in? What should we be in? And those other businesses uh, that, that we didn't think we should be in, or I didn't think we should be in, were businesses that we really nurtured as well. We made sure that people understood very clearly that, that these were important businesses. Uh, we created the right incentive structures for our people in there. And the point was, if city is not the home, that doesn't mean there aren't other great homes for a business of this sort. And that actually worked very well. And a good part of our 375 going to 260 came from that. Those actions where we did sell business in a very steady, methodical way to other people. Some of them we took public, and some of them were, uh, were sold to, um, to other uh, people in the financial services businesses. And the other part of this is we also went inside the organization and we started looking at, okay, are there actions or things that we're doing we shouldn't be doing for ourselves? And so we found a lot of uh, things we're doing on the processing side and we put them all together and say, okay, let's create a company around this. Let's create a company around these activities. Actually, we're not that great at doing these. These are good activities. We took some of those and we actually sold them to other people or we passed on those activities. So we sold some to Wipro, to Tata Consultancies, et cetera, companies of that sort who took uh, big areas of what we did and took them with them. And, uh, and that also accounted for a lot of what, uh, what uh, uh, we used to do. The third part of what we had to do is have some very strong, thoughtful uh, outplacement programs. And they, anything you had to do, you had to do on the basis of merits. Who was good, 
whether we needed them or not. Um, and we went through that in a very methodical way, including providing people help to find jobs somewhere else. We were helped by the fact that we were really early on in our restructuring when I came in, uh, while the crisis was, was beginning, starting, uh, you know, you didn't have the crescendo, so to say, so we started early on, and that really helped a lot of the activities that we did along that time. The, the most um, difficult thing culturally um, is to come out publicly and say 40% of your business is non-core. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, that is a incredibly difficult step to take. And we had to weigh a lot of different ways of going. So are we gonna say nothing and just sell something here, something there, some here, some there, and then the markets will start saying, hey, wait a minute, where are you going? Where are you gonna stop? And if we did that, that could destabilize everybody inside the organization. So the big decision we made was saying 60% of the company was core, and that core business had a certain culture we wanted, a certain direction the company had to take, certain businesses we were in, and certain types of clients we were gonna serve, and certain principles we were gonna follow. That became, on the other side, a rallying cry for everybody else to say, hey, this is the future, this is where we're going. And of course, we had to do exactly what you said, manage the other 40%, and I've talked about that. Yeah, um, hi, Mr. Panda, thank you for being here with us today. I'm a Felix Bernstein, uh, first year MBA student. Quick question for you, you, know, you mentioned um, that you're now back to the basics and focusing on the core business. And I guess I'm curious to know, what systems are you putting in place as the pendulum swings and um, you, know, you don't try to uh, dance as the music sort of begins to play? Thank you. Well, I don't dance, so that's a, that's a good <laughs> thing. Music or not uh, wouldn't make a difference. Uh, but the most important point is the point you're making. So what is the big difference uh, at City? Um, the big difference, uh, let me talk a little bit about the trends we see, okay, going on around the world. One, we think there are going to be 150 cities around the world that are going to be 50% of the GDP of the world in the next two, two and a half, three decades. Um, and we're today in about 120 of those cities. Now, what's interesting about those cities, and I've talked to publishers and people of that sort, the 18-year-old in those cities, like 18-year-old in Sao Paulo, has a lot more in common with the 18-year-old in Moscow than they may have with their parents in those cities. So the interconnectedness, the mode of thinking and how the 150 cities think is an incredible shift that's ahead of us. It's in addition to urbanization. It's sort of homogenization in, in, in intellectual uh, direction. And so we've got to stop thinking about countries in our business. We need to start thinking about those 150 cities. They could all be in the US or they could be around the world. And so big change for us is looking at our consumer business and not having the systems being one for US, one for UK, one for Russia, one for Brazil, but we're going completely global. It's the same consumer banking system around the world, which means that you can be a customer anywhere in the world, you walk into any city bank anywhere else in the world, you'll be recognized. People know who you are, what, what you have, what you need, not only that, related to that, you know where the world's going. It's going to have to be banking anywhere, anyhow, any device, any mode. And so the big shift systems-wise at City is we're going completely global, unified systems around the world to serve the consumer. The other big trend is global trade, global capital flows. And as much as we think that it's all about the developed markets trading with emerging markets, the big shift is Brazil to India, India to China, Africa to Brazil, south-south flows. Connecting those pipes to make sure we can intermediate money that flows around the world and trade that gets financed around the world, that's also the same institutional system around the world. So that's another system. That's the, those are the rails on which we move money every day. By the way, we're up to about, on average, three trillion dollars of cash we move around the world every day. And just about everything the US government does around the world is done through our pipes. The US embassy, banking system, those kind of things. 
so the, that's sort of the integration aspect of the systems we're designing. It's one company, it just happens to be in 150 locations. The last point, and I'll stop there, is data. I don't need to tell this group what data means. You all know exactly the power of data. We have more data than almost any other private company in the world because we're in 160 countries. We know consumer data. We need institutional data. We know flow data. We, need tra we know trading data. It's incredible the amount of information we have. And so the biggest thing we're doing, in my view, is uh, redoing our data management architecture to take these multiple petabytes of data we have and translate that into information and content for our clients to help them make better decisions. So the, as we look forward and we, as we look to the trends around the world, you know, our business hangs on a technological chassis. And that technological chassis is one chassis around the world. It's not only based on hardware systems and other architecture, but it's based on the same customer-facing architecture around the world and the same data architecture around the world. That's a lot of work and a lot of money. And for Citi, that's taking a company that used to be this way, siloed around the world, to shifting it horizontally, completely. And of course, you can imagine, we are therefore a dream client of just about anybody in this valley at this point. Um, I'm a recent alum, and I want to know what your uh, response to uh, dealing or coping with failure would be. My response to dealing or coping with failure? Uh, well, um, uh, it's it's so so I can I can look back and think about what did I do, <laughs> right? I mean, because uh, nobody ever has gone up or done what they've done in a straight line. It's always been on on the basis of a number of uh, setbacks, and and we and I have had uh, many in the process. Um, you know, I think the, uh, the, there is obviously the emotional aspect of failure, and then there's the rational aspect of failure. You know, you've got to cope through the emotional aspect of failure. I can't tell you how. I mean, it's, uh, it's related to families. It's related to your support system. It's related to your friends. It's related to finding strength somewhere to get through it. Uh, and I think it's important. I mean, do not ever minimize that aspect. Doesn't matter how rational you are, you're not going to be able to cope with uh, with failure unless you get over the emotional side because what you got to do there is you need to get yourself fortified to say I really want to figure out what went wrong and to figure out what went wrong to learn from it to say okay I'm going to go try again I'm going to try somewhere else I'm going to go to a different place but what can I learn from what I did where can I get help how do I get myself those skills to allow me to succeed. I mean, I think that's, that's sort of the natural step. And, and uh, in my own way, uh, the second stage takes time. The first stage is the stage you need to get over. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and believe me, I mean, we, we, we get a lot of positive and negative feedback every day. But, but coping with the, uh, coping with the, um, with the, uh, the scope of failure um, is something that has to be done emotionally first. Okay. Hi. Uh, we have time for one more question, I think. Hi, my name's Andy, and I'm a second year here at Stanford. Um, you mentioned that City is taking like a large stake in uh, sustainable energy and kind of green energy. And I was curious, what do you see as like the most viable in the next 10 years, in the next 15 years, um, the most viable kind of energy that you guys are inv investing in? And going along with that, with uh, rising gas prices and kind of more green vehicles. What do you see as the future of electric automobiles in not only the U.S. but internationally? Yeah, I mean, I think I think those are uh, those are all important questions, and it's a it's those are questions for which uh, we're all going to need answers, um, not in the context of what each what each one of us thinks individually, but also. Uh, in the context, a lot of these relate to collective decision making because uh, because you need systems set up. You know, you got gas pumps pumps everywhere around the country. Well, what's going to be the alternative? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, 
So look, I mean, I think, I think there, are, there are a couple of very interesting things that are happening. One is natural gas. Now, I understand it's a fossil fuel, right? I mean, it comes from down there very clearly, but it is clean energy. And we're running at $2 a cubic fit, uh, foot right now, which is incredible. I mean, it is a vastly different price point than everything else. And we've got a lot of that in the US. As a matter of fact, enough. Not only here, by the way, there's a lot in Israel, there's a lot in the Mediterranean Ocean, there's a lot in China, et cetera. So I would, I would look to having, uh, looking at natural gas, having a major role to play in terms of the next decade, a couple of decades in, in, in the energy future, including, by the way, having the freight fleet in the U.S. go to natural gas as a powering source versus gasoline and diesel, which is what they're using right now. The people I talk to, companies I talk to are investing, very few of them are going to diesel, very few of them are going to oil, very few of them are going to uh, gasoline. They're almost all going towards natural gas. That's a significant, significant um, a shift, in my view. Clean because of the source of the energy, but an important one. And I think the second big shift is uh, this debate over you know, what are cars going to get powered by. And, um, and uh, you know, I think that there's still a debate going on. There are lots of models in terms of where vehicles go. Now, the electric car sounds extremely appealing because you can shift from hydroelectric to gas to oil to coal or whatever you want at the back end, solar energy. As long as there's electricity, you don't need to change the infrastructure if it's electric. So it's a very, very appealing concept. And our guys have done a lot of work on it. As a matter of fact, uh, not only us, but uh, obviously the auto companies have. And Ed Morse, who, who does a lot of writing for us, has put out a wonderful report. I think it was last week or a couple of weeks ago and all this stuff. Um, but there are lots of differences, even in models in electric cars. Some of them are you plug and you get charged up and you travel. And there are other models. There's a company called A Better Place. And it's an Israeli company. And what they do is they say that we're in the business of having you shift out your battery into a new one in 45 seconds if you want a new source of energy. It's a different model. What it says is you don't necessarily have to only plug in your car to charge, but your new gas stations are battery changing stations. You go in there and the same time as it takes you to fill up a gas tank, you take the battery out and replace it, and you're on your way again. But that requires a grid. It requires changing stations. It requires a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure to it. So I think the the changes in battery technology, which, uh, uh, which is actually accelerating a pretty good phase, together with economic models like the Better Place model, could actually create a real future for electric cars. So you may find a bifurcated market. You may find freight running on natural gas. You could find commuting happening on electric cars. I mean, that's a real possibility for the future, but it's in play. I mean, this is happening now, and you know the, uh, you guys are too young to know this, but beta versus VHS, you know, you could have a better product versus inferior product, but one is adopted. Or the typewriter example of how QWERTY becomes the, uh, becomes the, the, the scale. So we're at that stage where it would be helpful to have a lot more thinking on a national basis of where should we be going. But some of these standards may be set for us going forward. But I'm actually very, very excited and very encouraged by the entire energy area. It's one of those areas of good fortune that we haven't been counting on. I'm not so sure the markets have completely discounted this yet either. But it's going to be one thing that may turn out to be a positive for all of us over the next 10 years. It looks like we're out of time. I wanted to thank you very much for being just so open and sharing your insight. Um, you've not only encouraged me to really identify my passions, but also to, um, to buy some more city shares. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Change lives, change lives, change organizations, change organizations, change the world.